Last week on Friday or Thursday night, President Trump talked about tariffs on Mexico and boy did the markets react. Now some might think that that could possibly be the black swan event because it was such a shocker and that's what black swan events are. But whether or not they actually go through with the tariffs, it is quite possible and even maybe probable that the black swan event already occurred and it's not one that's really being discussed, which is why it's a black swan event. This is exactly what we're gonna talk about, not just today, but all week in a very special report. And I'm getting goosebumps already. And that's coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading. And quite honestly, I have been groomed for this moment in time. I have been in these markets on some level since I was 10 years old and I'm 64 years old. And I got to tell you that the shackles on the back of my neck are standing up like crazy. Anybody that's been watching this for any length of time knows that this is not the only urgent report I've done, but I haven't done one in a really long time. And today is absolutely critical because I think that the trade wars have just exploded and this will, if it isn't already the black swan event, it's certainly going to lead to that. And as a reminder, it's something, a black swan event is something that nobody thinks is possible. Lehman was the black swan swan event in 2008 that took the whole system down. That was my alma mater. I was paying attention to that. That was one of the most highly regarded firms and has been around for 125 years and all of this. And that was game over. What occurred after the Lehman event was that the central banks couldn't support and the, and the Wall Street couldn't support the markets and the system died. And I am not exaggerating and I am not kidding you. So what exactly happened? And then I'm gonna show you why this has me so troubled. Because President Trump tweeted on Thursday afternoon at 4.30, so after the markets closed, that starting on June 10th, there was going to be a 5% tariff across everything that Mexico imported until and unless they stop the flow of illegal immigrants. So he's using tariffs to build his border wall. Now, look, the real problem with this is not that. It's the surprise. It's the shock. And it's the fact that China comes out and says, how can you trust Trump to honor a deal? How can you do that? I want you to really think about this because Trump's 180 degree turn on one of the U.S.'s largest and friendliest, I might say, trading partners is sending an ominous message to the international community that he cannot be trusted. Look, what are we in? We're in a contract debt-based system. And what is President Trump doing? He is changing the rules of globalization. I was a new stockbroker back in 86, and I remember all of the talk about globalization and how it was going to shift jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember thinking to myself, hmm, I don't know how great an idea that is. So it has nothing to do with whether I agree or I disagree. But what's really happened, and we're gonna talk more about this, I want you to really see what I pulled up here, is that once you establish whatever those rules are, and these rules were about 
corporations and really giving corporations actually sovereignty over governments. We've gone through this in different um, YouTube videos that we've seen. And now you're changing the rules. Guess what? Anytime you have a massive change, you think there might be a little bit of danger? Because what all of this is really showing us is that counterparty confidence is gone. That is huge. And even though the only guarantee that I can ever give you is that I will show up and I will do the work, that's the only guarantee. As soon as someone or something else is involved, all guarantees are off the table. But I, I'm going to put my technical neck on the line because I've been watching confidence erode. First, it was in the interbanks, bank to bank lending. The banks don't trust each other to get that money paid back, that contract. And that was huge. It set off LIBOR and all sorts of other things that we've talked about. Then in 2015, it was central bank to central bank with the Swiss surprise. Yes, we're committed to keeping our peg to the Euro dollar and two days later, gone. Now, you've got in a, in, when you're renegotiating every single trading contract, on earth, even if you're not doing all of them yet, but you're working toward that and some big key significant ones are being renegotiated, no trust, no confidence in who might be signing that. So this is counterparty confidence erosion. This is huge, 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 huge. Why? Because Because confidence in the counterparty is what enables the flow of funds around the world. It's what enables it. So if all of a sudden you don't, you don't trust that counterparty, you are not going to be able to do anything with it. And the system freezes. It's game over. One of our strategy specialists in the back was telling me when I was giving them a little update just before I came on here, and he shared this with me, so I'm going to share it with you because I want you to see what I'm talking about. A friend is in the motorcycle parts business and he is being told by Chinese business contacts that prices are going up because of the tariffs. He shared that business has slowed. The business is having a hard time vetting if his Chinese counterparts are being honest about which parts are being affected by tariffs. In other words, somebody here that's doing business with them, they can't determine whether or not the parts that they buy from China are actually part of the tariffs. So they are having confidence and trust with each other, a, a complete breakdown because they don't know if they're being dealt with fairly. That is not a good sign. Can you see how if that starts to spread even inside of the supply chain, which we're going to talk about because it's a very big deal. How that could freeze the system? Wait, let me show you more. Because, again, I've probably explained this before, but think about this from your own personal experience. Anytime you hear the word should, what does that typically mean? It means it ain't done. Whatever you think should happen. So... What is that White House head of trade come out and say? Well, this move, in other words, the tariffs on Mexico should not have been a surprise. Well, uh, guess what? Markets were shocked. It was a surprise. And I want you to look that every single market is coordinated. I'm just showing you the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ. But did you know the day before? Did you know before the close on Ford, on, on uh, Thursday night at 4.30 that this was going to happen? Do you think you might have gotten out of your positions if you knew they were going to take a massive dump like that? Because we've been talking about it for a long time. But that's the point of the Black Swan event. You don't have time to make any move. 
2008, the system was shut down. In 29, the system was shut down. In 87, the system was shut down. And they have all the mechanisms in place to shut this down when a run occurs. What's a run? A lot of people wanting their money back. That's simple. Whether it's a bank or from an ETF or from Wall Street or insurance company or any financial institution or even some non-financial institutions that are called shadow banks because they do things like banks, they just don't take deposits that can be bailed in. And we're going to be talking more about shadow banks in the future. In fact, that's the one I'm going to do. I'm going to do two next week that need to be discussed in here. One will be on shadow banks. Megan, please write this down. One will be on shadow banks and the other is going to be on China because there's so much to that that I just couldn't put it in this. I want to be able to spend enough time on each slide. But needless to say, the markets were shocked and they all kind of dropped within the same level and we know that these markets have been coordinated. Well, Navarro also says that investors should look at this calmly. And I do believe it was Jim Cramer when yield curves inverted. We're going to be talking about that in just a minute. But when the uh, 10 year and three month yield, treasury yield curves inverted in March and Cramer says, yeah, well, something, something like this. I'm, this is not a quote, direct quote, but it, the essence of yeah, well, maybe it's a problem, but you investors stay the course. Yeah, that was the end of March. Here we are back in, where are we? June, we're now in June and we're having this same issue because they couldn't get this bird to fly. They couldn't reinflate or keep these markets inflated. Triple top. We are going to be talking about this with Greg Manorino tomorrow. You are not going to want to miss that one. And I'll, I'll give you all the particulars. But when these markets dropped, what did it do? They breached cre uh, key technical levels but maybe even more importantly, and going back to that confidence piece, because these markets are held together by public confidence. That's still the confidence that has to go away. But counterparty confidence being lost is a very, 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 very big deal. It is a very, very, very big deal. So with the market's behavior like this and the Dow going below 25,000 as the S&P breaking key levels and the NASDAQ breaking key levels, not only is that technically bad, but psychologically, it is not good at all. It is not good at all. And the tariffs and the really, they impact the entire global economy. So it is not, well, that's over there and this is over here because it doesn't matter whether it's housing and real estate, farming, food, agriculture, vehicles, electric machinery, regular machinery, fossil fuels. It doesn't really matter. Every single aspect of the economy is impacted by these trade wars. And I said a long time ago, and I still believe that this is true, that these trade wars and the increase, the noticeable increases in prices that these trade wars are bringing and are likely to bring could be just an excuse for the start of hyperinflation. Because we've already seen that the monetary velocity, the speed at which money changes hands, which if you anticipate prices are going up, you're more likely to spend money that you get in your hand faster. We've already seen that shift begun. We've seen a lot of shifts begun. This is just the most current one. And really what happened on Friday? It was stocks, it was bonds, all fall. So some safe havens. But I want you to keep in mind and think about it for yourself. When you're used to something, that's your normal and that's your standard. Hey, we're all creatures of habit and we like it the way we like it, especially if you have an advantage in the way current things are set up. So if somebody comes in and says, you know, this agreement, this contract just is not working for me anymore. 
I want to change it. Well, what do you think is likely to happen? Well, first you're likely to get pushback because why would they want it to be changed if there was an advantage to them? But then they might get angry and they might do things. So I want to look at the impact of globalization and the real risk because so much of this is about that supply chain. Allowing corporations to build factories and build their products in the cheapest places around the world for labor means that to, to make one piece, there's a whole bunch of components and those components are made in different parts of the world. Most of them emanating out of China. So this happens to be uh, clothing and the two top component exporters, China and the EU, which we also know is slowing down. We're going to talk more about that. And for telecom, the U.S. is below China and the EU. These are the three top exporters in the global supply chain. So China and the EU are ahead of everybody else. Well, what happened in March when, hmm, the three month and the 10 year yield um, inverted. We know that the yield curve inversion in the US started in December, okay? But the 10 and the three month converted or inverted in March, right when all the data about the global slowing was picking up speed, whether it's in the EU whether it's in Japan or whether it's in the US. And I want you to really kind of think about this piece because we need expansion to be able to pay all that debt. And yet in this current report, US manufacturing dives to more than a nine year low. Well, that doesn't mean more money in but it could mean more inflation ahead. But this is very, very troubling. It's very troubling because the reality is, is the supply chain is completely interconnected. So if that guy can't get his parts from China, well, maybe he can get it from Bangladesh, but Bangladesh may well get some of it, part of that from China. So it isn't that is there and this is here. We live in a globalized, interconnected world. And when change happens, you think there might possibly be something to happen that nobody was expecting. It's not been done before. And it's not an easy thing, even for you. Think about all the people in 2008 that were in mortgages, for example. And what happened? Well, they thought it was going to get better because the Federal Reserve kept coming out and all the global central bankers kept coming out and saying, well, you know, this is, this is as bad as it's going to get. It's going to be okay. This is as bad as it's going to get. So what did people do? And I want you to think about this. If they had savings, they used up their savings waiting for things to get better. And they didn't get better in a timely fashion. So a lot of smaller businesses and a lot of people used up their savings and then they were done. And then they lost everything. They lost, you know, all the homes that they had, mortgages. They, they lost everything. But they kept it going as long as they had savings. I want you to hold on to that thought for a slide I'm going to show you and we're going to talk about in a minute. But keep in mind, that an interconnected supply chain really means interconnected economies. So if it slows in Europe or it slows in China or it slows in Bangladesh or it slows in the US, it slows everywhere, everywhere. And I wanna talk a lot more about that yield curve inversion because the bond market 
right now. I mean, as the Fed was raising the rents, moving or raising the interest rates, moving into December, and we know what was happening with the markets during that period of time, December 24th, the worst day in since 29 or something like that. I don't have the data right in front of me, but it was like one of the worst days ever. And then Wednesday, that was Monday, on Wednesday, you had the best market move ever because of this manipulation. But it doesn't matter where that came from. The bond market's death spiral, the inverted yield curve, says a recession is near. It doesn't matter. Even if President Trump does not ultimately put tariffs on Mexico, well, they, they put tariffs on India on Friday night. When, after the close of the market, when everybody was sleeping into a weekend. So, I mean, there is no trust or confidence in these counterparties. This is really bad. And we're getting all of these technical indicators of a, of a near recession. Is it going to be tomorrow? Well, for some people, we never moved out of a recession. Quite honestly, even though officially, because they managed to generate positive inflation, so therefore we're not in a recession, that's garbage. These gray bars on the Federal Reserve charts all indicate official recessions. So we're not in one now officially, although there are some people that would argue with that. And yet we have crossed that line again. This is the same graph. This is the long-term one. So you can see we, what is this? This was 1987 in here. And then we had that recession. We have 2000 and then, well, you know, long-term capital management, derivatives explosion. We have that recession. This is 2007 going into the 2008 recession. Okie dokie. Well, this is, this is just year to date. Goes just back to January. So you could see these two inversions. There it is. There it is. There it is. People always ask me when, when, when. This is telling you soon, soon, soon. Can I tell you the exact date? Of course not. That is not within my control. But wouldn't you much rather, for me, you do whatever you want. I mean, that's up to you. But I look at this data. I've been living inside of this data for the past 54 years. For me, I would always rather be two weeks too early, two years too early, I don't care, than one second too late. Because when these markets freeze, all of your choices freeze with them. So this could possibly be your very last opportunity to get any wealth that you were thinking about getting out of the market Get, you do whatever you want. I don't hold any there. I wouldn't be holding any there. If I had some in there right now, I would get it out. You do whatever you want. We're going to talk about gold in here because if you're not going to get it out, then at the minimum, get it protected. It's going to be cheaper now to do that. You'll still have some availability on gold, even as this thing, well, I don't know. I know what it looked like in 2008, where availability was drying up. But this is probably the cheapest opportunity you're going to have moving forward into the future. Because one thing I want to go into a whole lot more comes from that report from the IMF. And what you're looking at here is sovereign vulnerabilities. And they are elevated in both advanced and emerging market economies. The red line here are the emerging markets. And so they're 80% vulnerable. That's pretty risky. But what's even worse, and if this doesn't scare you, it scares me it scares me, is that advanced economies. So who's the emerging? That's China. We're going to talk more about that next week. But who are the advanced economies? Hmm. The U.S., 
the Eurozone, and Japan. Any of them seem to really be in good shape? I mean, even though they're telling you the economy is so great, all of the underlying data and support is saying, no, it's not. It's going into, and this will be so much more than just a recession because central banks are out of tools. They're out of tools. And they're telling you that advanced economy government bonds, those bonds that are the foundation that we're told is the safest thing that you can do because they can tax you to get the money to repay you. They can print it at will. That is what is saying that we are at 100% vulnerable and 100% at risk. That's what's at risk. We've talked about doom loops many times. You might want to go back and look at some of the work that I did specifically on doom loops. But a sovereign debt freeze is going to impact all the sovereign debt that's in all of those banks that are so highly leveraged right now and have been allowed and encouraged to get even more leveraged since the crisis began in 2008. Just what do you think will happen in a sovereign debt crisis? Do you remember what happened in Europe? Because that wasn't that long ago, what, that 2013, 14, 15, as the European sovereign debt crisis unfolded, what did they see? Oh my gosh, the local banks have an awful lot of the sovereign debt. So the sovereign debt loses value. What do you think happens to the banks? Then the banks print money, or rather the governments print money, give it to the banks to buy more of the government debt. None of that was cleared up. All of that garbage is still there. So that doom loop will explode. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say it in such a definitive way. But if that's what the data tells me, then I got to put my technical neck on the line and tell you what I see and what I think about it. This, this is not good. This is totally not good. And now, because we've got this conflict trade war going on with China that is escalating and China's sitting on an awful lot of treasuries. Well, they take a much longer view than we do. They're looking at 100 years, 500 years. We're looking at four years. And at this point, because of re-election, that time frame is much, much more narrow. No one thinks that China will use their U.S. Treasury debt holdings as a weapon. That could be the black swan event that pulls it down. Now look, next week I'm going to talk a lot more about China because there's some data that I need to verify. And I'm not exactly sure of the date, so you can't hold me to this, but you'll be able to next week. Because um, I, I'm pretty sure it was 2011 or 12 or something like that. I could be wrong look next week, where uh, the U.S. Treasury gave China direct asset access to their computer database to buy treasury bonds. Now, I don't know if that link was removed. That's what I've got to find out about. We're going to talk about that next week. But there's no other country that the U.S. ever gave that linkage to. And if they haven't removed it yet, well, we're going to have to think about the implications of that. So you don't want to miss that one next week. But I personally would not put it past China to take down the system. They got to reset their debt. They're not in any better shape than we are. But what we do know is the power has been flowing in that direction since 2008. I wouldn't write it off like everybody else is, no one thinks they'd use it. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But what we know is they do not trust the U.S. to live up to their end of the bargain. So if that's the case, how can we even have a bargain? How can we even have a trade agreement? 
And China has benefited massively from this. I'm going to talk more about that because we need to look at the peg between the yuan, the Chinese currency, and the U.S. dollar and how that's been breaking down. So much information, so many moving parts. And what's been the result of that? Well, let's see. Because with all of this swirling around, there's a flight to safety. There's always a flight to safety when people are scared. And of course, China has been buying gold. But I want to take you back to 2006 when China encouraged their population and allowed them to own gold again and then made it easy for them to buy and own gold. In addition, not one drop of gold that is mined by China leaves China. And by the way, I'm pretty sure that if you're traveling to China and you wear a gold necklace, you better put it on the claim form that you're going in there with a gold necklace because I'm pretty sure you're not taking it out unless they know that you had it. Let me show it to you in a little bit more granular way because as this fear has exploded, we've got the 10-year treasury price. When yields go down, oh, Megan, do you have a pen there? Can I borrow a pen, please? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, these are your bonds. These are yields. This is the principal. This is when they issue it. When yield goes up, bond values go down. When yields go down, bond values, market values go up. The further away you are from when the bond was issued, so the longer the maturity, the greater that fluctuation. So in a flight to safety, that means that people have been flying to what the IMF says is 100% vulnerable and at risk. Hmm. Hmm. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Don't you think? Now, the other place that it went was to the US dollar, which is kind of flattish, but up, trending up a little bit. And how are U.S. dollars created? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. By taking on more debt. So when the government issues these treasury bonds, bills, notes, they're creating dollars. And what do they need? More inflation. We need that inflation. Which means that central banks are telling you the dollar, actually all fiat money, is overvalued. And they're taking it down. Well, that's, that's really a good, safe place to hold your wealth, don't you think? And you could tell I'm being facetious. I hope you can. Gold went up in terms of spot, and so did silver. As the stock market and as the oil market were dumping. Now, really, what do stocks and oil represent? Growth or the lack of it? in the global economy. So they're tanking and you've got treasuries up a bit as yields go down, flight to safety, dollars. That is the frying pan and the fire. Either way, you're getting cooked. It doesn't matter. Either way. What is the gold? What is the physical silver? Well, quite honestly, that's savings. That other stuff, it's just a debt illusion of wealth. I'm going to use SoftBank as an example, and I'll probably be doing it after next week because I got a lot to do for next week. I've got to, you've got to understand. I'm sorry, I'm going way too fast. What I hope you see is just how precarious we really are in this whole system. I feel like I'm living inside of a Stephen King novel. And the reason why I say that is because in those novels, you've got things, people and, and circumstances that are happening all around, but they're all coming to this one central moment when there's this huge explosion. And that's the way I feel about all of this. 
and I'm watching it unfold and I'm putting my technical neck on the line. I mean, look, I'm not queen. I don't get to control any of this. But I have been looking at this material and this information on some level since I was 10 years old. Thank you, Uncle Al. Because he showed me how you could hold gold when it's illegal to hold gold and hold it legally. And that is embedded on my brain and that's real money. He also showed me the trend cycle of a tangible and how it always goes from undervaluation to fair valuation to overvaluation to fair valuation to undervaluation in a continuous figure eight. Why? Because they're tangibles. They don't disappear and evaporate like intangibles can and do. Banking at 15, stockbroker in 86, studied currencies since 87, and I'm an artist. I see patterns. That's why you always hear me talk about patterns. Because when you recognize a pattern, you're seeing what they don't want to see. They don't want you to see. And I, I'm so grateful. I'm seriously so grateful because I have the ability to see this that happens over here buried over on page 101 in the newspaper over there or separated by dates. But I see how they all flow together. We live in an interconnected world. It was relatively easier. Any change is dangerous. Any change is dangerous. When they were forming the interconnected global economy, well, we used to be the clothing manufacturers to the world. I remember, you know, I went to college in Teaneck, New Jersey, and was a very cute boyfriend. He had a father that worked in the garment district. I remember going over there and hustle and bustle and people moving carts. And some of you may have experienced that. That was the fashion capital of the world. We don't have that anymore. We don't have that anymore. That all went away. All those jobs, they all went away. So in any kind of change, you're going to have winners and you're going to have losers. And the winners figure out what those new rules are and how they can take advantage of them. China pegged to the U.S. dollar so that corporations would feel comfortable going over there and building their manufacturing plants because they know, first of all, cheap labor, but second of all, they'd be able to calculate what their profits would be because the currencies were linked. We got to talk about this. We're going to talk about it uh, next week. I wish there were more days in this week, but there aren't. So we'll talk about it next week. This is a very big deal. Tomorrow, I mean, I mean, we had it planned. He was supposed to be on before, and then something came up, and we've had to wait, but I really think it was fate because tomorrow at 2 p.m. live, we're going to have Greg Manorino, and we're going to talk about the breakdown, the technical breakdown, and the psychological breakdowns that he sees, that I see, that we see. So that you can ask, there'll be a live Q&A after that. Make sure you ask all of your questions in all of these because if we don't get to them, we're going to aggregate them and we're going to do Q&A on Thursday anyway. And I probably should have told you that in the beginning. I'm just so I, I'm wanting to get to this material thank because you. it's so critical. Okay, thank you, Megan. She's so good. She's, I just love her. So tomorrow we've got Greg. On Wednesday, I'm going to talk to you about the changes at the SEC that encourage risk-taking and remove investor protections. Now, this is not the first time we've had this discussion. So I'll show you how they've been dismantling it since the crisis. Now, it's Sarbanes-Oxley that they're going but by investor protections because what Enron didn't have. It's been a long enough period of time. Who remembers Enron and WorldCom? Maybe you do. Maybe you remember what happened to all those people 
that we're working at these two behemoths that could never possibly go away. And all those employees that had all the retirement money in those high flying stocks that all went away. So after the crisis, the foxes make new rules. Enough time goes by, eh, we don't need those anymore. Let's make sure that those that can fail, that are not too big to fail, meaning you and meaning me, let's make sure that they can because much better they fail than the corporations and the banks. Well, I disagree with that. I disagree with that so strongly. And let me tell you, my very favorite question is how many times can you be lied to when you do not know the truth? It is not okay for me, for you to be lied to. That's, that is so not okay. I can't even stand how much not okay that is. That's why I do this work. And I'll tell you something else that I think is kind of interesting because a lot of people don't fully understand my motivation. So I'm going to tell you what really motivates me. You're counting on me and you trust me. And I've been groomed for this moment in time. I got to bring you whatever it is that I have. Some people might be concerned about, oh, well, what if I say this and something else happens and maybe that'll hurt my reputation, blah, blah, blah. Look, I'm a human being. That's all I am. I have no control over any of this other than because I have been trained in tangibles, because I have been trained in banking and in stock brokering, so Wall Street. I understand this language that they make opaque and complex so they can steal your wealth. I work for you. That's why I do it. That's the first and foremost reason. And you can really, there are lots of clients and some know who they are. I don't know if they're watching today, but in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, those lovely, wonderful, I love them clients have been absolutely instrumental in teaching me how to do all this stuff that you see me do because I wanted them to understand this so much. And if they didn't understand it, even after I had done all the work, I didn't say, oh, they just don't get it. I did it again a little differently to see if I couldn't get further. And you see the result. That and the original owner of this company making me vet everything. I really, it was a pain in the neck, but I'm so grateful because I needed both of those skills to be able to be of service to you today. And that is really why I do it. And it doesn't matter that nobody else knows that. You know it. I know it. That's what drives me. I don't want you to lose what you've worked so hard for, for what? For them? For banks? For corporations? I don't think so. Get real savings. That's all I can tell you. Get real savings. Food, water, energy, security, community, barterability, wealth preservation. Please, people. We are running out of time. We are running out of time. So until tomorrow, I really want you to keep in mind, wealth shields, are made of physical gold and silver. That's what they're made of. Not paper or promises and certainly not contracts. So until tomorrow, two o'clock with Greg Manorino, I am so excited. I am so grateful that the timing on all of this worked out. This week, this, this whole week, is a critical week to be paying attention. Share this. Share, 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 share. And when you can't think of anybody to share with, share it again. It's up to them if they open it up, if they pay attention. But, you know, I mean, I have people in my family that I will not pay attention. Okay, I'm not going to let them suffer. That All that means is that I need to prepare for them as well as for me. That's what that means. Get 
prepared. Until tomorrow, please, please, please be safe out there. Bye.